All right, let's get started. Okay, so welcome everyone to Bio 66 Exam 3 Review Workshop. My name is Jason. I am one of the peer tutors uh, for the CHHS Student Success Center along with Stacy. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a fourth year kinesiology major uh, with, with an emphasis in IPAC. Uh, in my free time, I like to play basketball, volleyball, uh, I like to play video games too, especially the Valorant, and I also watch anime. So that's just a little bit about me. All right. <clears throat> oh, and also here are my tutoring hours, right? On Mondays, I have my tutoring shift from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Wednesdays, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Thursdays, 4 to 6, okay? And to schedule an appointment, you just go to the Spartan Connect website here and use your... SJSU login, and then click on the big blue button on the right-hand side, the appointments, drop-in, workshop, events button, and then you just follow all the prompts, all right? Okay. All right, so, so in this workshop, like I said, I will go over important concepts from chapters 11, 13, 14, and 15. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about the control of hormone secretion, um, the posterior and anterior pituitary gland and the three hormone sequence. And in chapter 13, I will go over pulmonary and systemic circulation and the cardiac cycles, the systole and diastole. All right. In chapter 14, I'm going to cover cardiac output and what factors regulate cardiac output and stroke volume and heart rate. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the baroreceptor reflex. And if we have time, I will go over ventilation mechanics, and I hope we have time. So that's for chapter 15. And um, this workshop will also include multiple practice questions through using the poll feature. All right, so in the next slide, I'm gonna give you guys an example of what that means and give you guys familiar, get you guys familiar with the polling feature. Keep in mind that your lecture exam three is tomorrow, Thursday, November, November 4th, okay? All right. Let's go. So here is practice question. So whenever we come across like a check for understanding question or practice question, I'm going to launch a poll and you guys can have an opportunity to uh, pretty much answer it on your own. And I would give you guys about a minute or so to answer the question. Okay, so you guys all answer this. So I'm gonna end the poll. And then at the end of the practice question or at the end of the poll, I'm going to share the answer and it will be shown on the right hand, right bottom right, all right? So you guys all got this correct. The actual exam is tomorrow, Thursday, November 4. <clears throat> so now let's go over chapter 11, the endocrine glands. Let's first have a brief overview of what the endocrine, endocrine system is. Okay, so the endocrine system is pretty much a system uh, uh, which consists of endocrine glands that secrete hormones and hormone secreting cells in various organs, right? It is a major uh, physiological control system that regulates all of our biological responses. So for example, this system regulates our metabolism, our growth, and uh, stress and it's things like that. So the endocrine system consists of glands and hormones. What are glands? Well, glands are, you know, these organs or group of epithelial cells that synthesize it. Like they make and they secrete chemical substances into the blood, right? Hormones. So glands are what makes and releases hormones into the blood. And so, yeah, I was send you the link in a bit, okay? All right. Okay, so, so, sorry. Now we talked about glands. Let's talk about hormones, right? Hormones are biologically active chemicals that serves as a chemical messenger in the blood to uh, to to stimulate specific cells or organs into action. What does that mean? So, hormones. Think of it as a messenger, right? It tells, it produces an effect in our body. It produces a physiological effect, right? And hormones are secreted by endocrine glands, as I mentioned, into the bloodstream, 
right? The messengers, they produce an effect in our body. Oops, sorry. And on the right-hand side, we can see some examples of endocrine glands, right? We have the thyroid glands, adrenal glands, pancreas, uh, pituitary gland, and other glands of the bodies. These are just a few examples. So what factors regulate uh, the secretion of hormones? So there are three main factors. Does anyone remember what those three factors are? If you read to unmute yourself or type in the chat. And I'm gonna type it in the chat too. Okay, I see one answer so far. Okay. Okay, thank you, Esther. So, right, you just mentioned it, ion secretion. So the first factor is ions, the concentration of ions in organic nutrients, right? So the plasma concentration of ions and nutrients are regulated by hormones through negative feedback, right? So for example, when we eat, there's gonna be increased concentration of glucose, right? Glucose is uh, one of our body's major nutrients, glucose. So when there's an increased concentration of glucose, there's gonna be an increased secretion of another hormone. And in this case, there's gonna be increased secretion of insulin, all right? So you can see where this kind of going, right? So when there's an increased concentration of a certain nutrient, let's say glucose, for example, there's gonna be um, secretion of a certain hormone, insulin in our case, all right? So that's the first factor. Now, the second factor is nervous system, okay? Our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, especially, right? Our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, they control a majority of our um, endocrine glands, right? Such as the adrenal medulla, okay? And neurotransmitters also play an important role when it comes to hormone secretion, right? The neurons of our brains directly regulate the hypothalamus and the posterior, posterior pituitary gland. Okay, so that's the second factor. Now, last one, hormones, right? Of course, hormone secretion can uh, be directly controlled by the blood concentration of another hormone, okay? And um, the names of these hormones typically end in the term tropic or trophic, okay? So tropic or trophic hormones uh, stimulate secretion of another hormone, right? So for example, um, the adrenal cortical tropic hormone or ACTH. This tropic hormone stimulates the secretion of cortisol, right? Cortisol is another hormone, right? It's a stress hormone. So this is just an example, right? So tropic hormones, whenever you come across a word uh, or whenever you come across a hormone that ends tropic, know that um, it's going to influence the secretion of another hormone, all right? Any questions about this so far? All right, moving on. So now let's talk about hormone transport, like how are hormones transported throughout our bodies? So I refer to this as blood-borne transport, right? Remember how I mentioned that the endocrine glands are the organs that makes, that synthesizes and releases hormones into the bloodstream, right? So they're first being released into the interstitial fluid, okay? So the first being released into the interstitial fluid, then they diffuses from the ISF or the interstitial fluid, and then they enter the bloodstream. And then eventually they travel to the target cell. So it starts in the endocrine glands, release an interstitial fluid, diffuses, and then gets in the bloodstream and go to the target cell, all right? So there are two different modes of transport, right? We have polar and non-polar hormones. Does anybody remember what polar hormones uh, are? Like is polar water soluble or is it not water soluble or is it lipid soluble? Feel free to just throw it out to the chat or mute yourself. Is polar, is pol does polar mean Water soluble or lipid soluble? Okay, Janet, okay. So, right, exactly. So polar means water soluble, right? So polar hormones are water soluble. That means they're able to dissolve in plasma. They can disperse, they can dissolve into the plasma. 
if they try, travel on their own. Now, <clears throat> polar hormones, they bind to receptors in the plasma membrane of target cells, right? Membrane, the outer layer of the target cells. Okay, so that means they don't enter the target cells yet. They bind to the receptors located on the outer layer, the plasma membrane of target cells. <clears throat> and some examples, some examples of polar hormones are polypeptides or proteins, glycoproteins and calicolamines. Right? These are just examples of polar hormones. Okay. Now, the other mode of transport, we have non-polar hormones. So since water pol since water, since polar is water soluble, what does non-polar mean? Does anybody know? Lipid soluble. Lipid soluble, exactly. So non-polar hormones are lipid soluble, right? They cannot dissolve in the plasma. They cannot dissolve in, in water. So because they're lipid soluble and cannot dissolve in the plasma, they have to be carried by something else to travel, to transport, right? So they're bound to carry proteins in plasma because they cannot dissolve, like I said. So non-polar hormones, right? They, they're, they're different than polar hormones in that they bind to receptors located in the cytoplasm of target cells, right? Inside of the cell. Remember how in polar hormones, polar, polar binds to the plasma membrane, the outer layer, but non-polar hormones binds to the cytoplasm, the receptors in the cytoplasm of target cells, All right? They've entered the target cells after they associate themselves from their carrier protein, right? And some examples of nonpolar hormones are steroids and thyroid hormones. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Okay. All right. So now we have a check for learn, check for understanding question. This is another practice question. And now I'm going to launch a poll, and you can try to answer this, but try to not use any notes. So then to test yourself, to sort of test yourself how much you know. All right. I may give you guys about a minute. Okay, 20 more seconds. <laughs> 10 more seconds. Okay, all right. I'm gonna end the poll. So the answer to this question is E, all of the above. Right. Remember how I've mentioned that there are three main factors that regulate the secretion of hormones, right? The first one I've talked about is uh, ions and nutrients, like the plasma concentration of ions and nutrients. That was the first factor, right? Think about glucose. Glucose is a nutrient and it uh, stimulates release of a hormone called insulin. That's an example, okay? So that's the first factor. The second factor is neurotransmitters, right? neurotransmitters or nervous system as a second factor. And then the last factor is hormones or tropic hormones. So um, since A, B, and C, and D are true, so the answer must be E, all right? Okay, all right. Let's have one more check for understanding. I'm gonna post the poll. Now, what kind of hormones are water soluble and bind to receptors located in what of the target cells? All right, I'm gonna give you guys a minute.
Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. So the answer to this question is A, right? Remember polar means water soluble and they can dissolve in the water and in, in the plasma and they bind to uh, the plasma membrane, just the outer layer of the cell, right? Okay, you guys all got this? All right. So now I'm gonna talk about the posterior pituitary gland, all right? So the posterior pituitary gland stores and releases hormones that are synthesized in the hypothalamus, this whole thing right here, okay? So in other words, the hypothalamus makes or synthesizes and secretes hormone and they're just being sent to the posterior pituitary gland and um, that's what's happening here, okay? So the hormones secreted by the hypothalamus or hypothalamic hormones are transported via the axons through the hypothalamophysial tract, okay? So the hormones are being transported to the posterior through the hypothalamophysial tract. And keep in mind that this tract is not a bloodstream, but it's rather a network of axons that leads to the capillaries here at the posterior pituitary, okay? So tract, so hypothalamic hypophysial tract is not a bloodstream, but it's a network of axons, okay? So there are two main hormones um, stored and secreted by the posterior pituitary. Can anybody tell me what those two hormones are? Does anybody remember? <clears throat> What are the two hormones that, that are stored and secreted by the posterior pituitary? Does anybody remember? Okay. I see one answer so far. Okay, so exactly, Janet. So the two hormones that are stored and secreted by the posterior pituitary are oxytocin and I, an antidiuretic hormone, All right? So for, let's take a look at oxytocin first. Oxytocin is a hormone that acts on smooth muscle wall in breast and uterus for female reproductive purposes, All right? So for example, um, oxytocin would be uh, released or secreted when during childbirth, right? They help to assist, they help to strengthen labor contractions. Right, they act on smooth muscle wall and breast and uterus. That's the function of oxytocin for female reproductive purposes. Now, let's take a look at antidiuretic hormone, okay? So there are two functions of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. ADH uh, acts on smooth muscle wall of the blood vessels to increase blood pressure, right? And I put down vasoconstriction here because vasal means blood vessels, right? And constriction means narrowing, constricting, right? So this means constriction of blood vessels, right? So ADH acts on the blood vessels to constrict them to increase blood pressure because it's greater resistance, right? That's the first function. Now, the second function of ADH is that they act on kidney collecting ducts to retain fluids in order to increase blood volume. Okay, so um, ADH tells our kidneys that, oh, we need more blood volume. We need more, more, we need more fluid in the blood. So please absorb, reabsorb more water back to our system. All right, so ADH, vasoconstrict, and they act, they act on kidney blood collecting duct to reabsorb more water in order to maintain the adequate amount of blood volume in our body. Make sense? Any questions about the posterior pituitary gland? All right, moving along. Now let's take a look at the anterior pituitary gland. So similar to the posterior, um, the anterior pituitary gland also um, receives hormones from the hypothalamus, right? but they're being sent or 
but the hypothalamic hormones are being sent to the anterior pituitary gland through the hypothalamo hypophysio portal system. Can anybody tell me what is the difference between the portal system and the tract? Right. So remember how so remember how the hypo, hypothalamo hypophysio tract was an ax, a network, network of axons. So what is this portal system? Okay, I see two responses. Exactly, right. So portal system is blood vessels, right? Bloodstream and tract is axons. Exactly. So, um, so just keep in mind the difference between the two, right? Portal system, blood vessels, and uh, the tract is network of axons. So now in the anterior pituitary gland, there is usually a three hormone sequence. Okay, so let's take a look at the first sequence. We've already discussed. We've already discussed the first sequence, right? The first sequence is a hypothalamic hormone um, being secreted secreted through the portal system to the anterior pituitary gland. That's the first sequence. Now, the second sequence is a secretion of an anterior pituitary hormone, right? Because when that when when the first sequence, when the hypothalamic hormones um, are being secreted and sent to the anterior that stimulate the secretion of an anterior pituitary, pituitary hormone. Okay, that's the second sequence. Okay, now the last step, the last sequence is usually um, a physiological response or that anterior pituitary hormone causes, stimulates the secretion of another hormone. Okay, we call it tropic hormone, remember? All right, so that's the third sequence. Okay, so first one is a hypothalamic hormone. Second one is the creation of an anterior pituitary hormone. And the third one is uh, a response, an effect, or stimulating, stimulating secretion of another hormone. Okay, and we're gonna take a closer look at this three hormone sequence in the next slide. So <clears throat> right here, I have a chart uh, consisting of all of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oops, sorry. All right, all right. Can anybody see? Can can anyone see my screen? Yes. Showing the three hormone sequence. Okay, awesome. So yeah, so these are the three. Uh, are the seven hormone sequences that you should memorize. All right, so I'm, I'm not gonna go over every single one of them because just because it's very time consuming, but um, I'm gonna give you, an, give you guys an example of how I would study this, okay? So let's take a look at uh, growth hormone releasing hormone, all right? Growth hormone releasing hormone. So remember, remember the three hormone sequence? The first sequence is the hypothalamic hormone, right? So I recognize that, oh, uh, the first step uh, is the growth hormone releasing hormone secreted by the hypothalamus, okay? So this is the first hormone sequence. Now, I also know that this hormone right here, it's going to influence the secretion. It's gonna stimulate or inhibit a secretion of an anterior pituitary hormone, right? So I know that, since the name itself says growth hormone releasing hormone, I know that, oh, it has to do with something. It has to do with the growth hormone, right? Because in his name, it literally says growth hormone releasing hormone, okay? So that's a second sequence here, all right? It's an anterior pituitary hormone, the growth hormone. Now, the last step, growth hormone literally means growth. Right, so it would stimulate protein synthesis and growth. All right, so um, that's one of the examples. Let's go over another example. Let's go over thyroid releasing hormone. All right, so thyroid releasing hormone is a hypothalamic hormone secreted by the hypothalamus. Right, and um, that's the first sequence, the TH, TRH, thyroid releasing hormone, first step. 
And I know that this is going to influence the secretion of another hormone. And in this case is called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the anterior pituitary gland. Okay. And then, so this is the second. And in the last sequence, we have the um, secretion of thyroid hormones at the thyroid gland, okay? So that's the third hormone sequence. So what I would do is I would um, actually study the names of these hormones, right? Instead of just the acronyms, right? I would study the full name because usually the name tells you, the name of the hormone tells you what the hormone does, what's the function of the hormone, right? So um, I would really use this chart as the reference to study, right? But just don't, don't like just use this chart, right? Also use the lecture slides to help you understand uh, where, where the target cells are and what the functions are, right? And if you don't know like, like the definition of certain names, right? If, if, if you don't know what follicle is, Google it, right? If you Google it, it's gonna tell you it has something to do with the female reproduction female reproductive, uh, reproductive system, right? So if follicles involves a female reproductive system, system, then it has to do with something, gamete production, estrogen production, stuff like that, right? So study the names, study all seven of these, and you should be good, all right? Are there any questions about the three hormone sequence? Um, no, hypothalamus is not the only place where trophic hormones are released, right? Uh, tropic or trophic hormones can also be released by the anterior pituitary gland, right? So for example, um, the adrenal cortical tropic hormone, right? So, um, so yeah, but whenever you come across the word, uh, or a hormone name that ends in tropic, just know that, oh, it's going to stimulate the release of another hormone. And in this case, it's going to be glucocorticoids or cortisol, a stress hormone, right? Make sense? Okay. Moving along. So let's have a little check for understanding or practice question about the three hormone sequence. Again, try not to use your notes or anything, try not to use um, any notes and try to answer this to the best of your ability. Sort of test yourself. And I'm going to give you guys a minute. Okay, 15 more seconds. <clears throat> and also, you guys can hear me well, right? Like my volume and everything is good. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. So the answer to this question is B. Right. So if you study the chart, if you're familiar with the three hormone sequence, you would know that somatostatin is a hypothalamic hormone secreted by the hypothalamus and it inhibits the release of growth hormone. Right. So somatos somatostatin is opposite to that of growth hormone releasing hormone. Right. So just study that on your own time. Right. Study this all seven of the three hormone sequences. Let's have one more for this section. What 
which hormone directly stimulates a thyroid gland to synthesize thyroid hormones. We just talked about this in earlier slides, right? <clears throat> Give you guys thirty more seconds. Hmm. You guys should be able to unmute yourselves and I should be able to hear. Um, that's weird. Um, okay, if you need to, if you, if you want to unmute yourself, you can just shout it out and I can just pause. All right, no, no worries. Or you can type in the chat. So either, either works. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll now. All right, so the answer to this question, all right, we, we've, we went over this, is E, all right? So if you read the questions carefully, it asks you what hormone directly stimulates the thyroid gland to synthesize thyroid hormones, right? So if you read the answers, if you look at the answers, you can see that um, there's a thyroid stimulating hormone here, right? So Usually, um, if you study the names of these hormones, you should know the function of them and what they do. Right? So that's a good tip. Good. So I'm gonna skip this. All right. So <clears throat> let's talk. Let's cover chapter 13 now: blood, heart, and circulation. In this chapter, um, I'm going to go over pulmonary and systemic circulation as well as systole and diastole, the cardiac cycles. So let's have a brief overview, a brief review of um, the four chambers of the heart and the valves of the heart. So we have four chambers of the heart, right? With the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. All right, so the right ventricle receives blood from systemic circulation. They receive venous blood from the superior and inferior vena cava, right? I'm sure you guys all know this. And the left atrium is another upper chamber, left atrium uh, receives blood from pulmonary circulation, from the pulmonary veins. It receives blood from the lungs. Then we have the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lung, right? The right, right ventricle pumps blood to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery. And the left ventricle pumps blood to, uh, pumps oxygen in the blood to the rest of our body through the aorta. Right? I'm sure you guys all know this. So, and we also have four valves of the heart. Does anybody remember what this valve right here is? The valve that separates the right atrium and the right ventricle. Tricuspid valve, exactly. So tricuspid valve, uh, also known as AV valve or atrioventricular valve, separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. Okay, now what about this one right here? This left one that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. What is this valve called? Exactly, mitral or bicuspid, good. And it is also one of the AV valves, the atrial ventricular valves, right? Because atrial means atrium, ventricular means ventricles, right? Atrial ventricular valve separates the atrium from the ventricles, right? Now, what about this one right here that separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary arteries? Should be pretty straightforward. Mm, not quite. Yes, pulmonary valve. So, this is called the pulmonary valve. And it's, it's not the AV valve because remember atrial ventricular valves um, in the name means atria 
and ventricles. It separates the atrium from the ventricles only, right? But in this case, um, the right ventricles, or in this case, this valve right here called the pulmonary valve separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary arteries. It doesn't separate from the atrium, but it separates the right ventricles from the pulmonary artery. Make sense? Okay. And the last one we have is the aortic valve, right? It separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Right. Thank you. So yeah, AV valves uh, are tricuspid and bicuspid or mitral valves. Mm -hmm. It's good. And keep in mind that um, this muscle right here called the interventricular septum is a muscle that separates the two lower chambers, the two uh, ventricles of the heart, all right? Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about blood circulation. So circulator our circulatory system is an organ system that is made up of blood vessels that carry blood away from and towards the heart, right? It's blood circulation. Now, there are two types of circulation. We have pulmonary and systemic circulation. Let's take a look at pulmonary first. So pulmonary circulation is the circuit through which low oxygen in the blood travels from the right ventricle, travels from the right ventricle through the lungs and then back to the heart in the left atrium with oxygen in the blood. Okay, so to put it in simple terms, right? So whenever you come across pulmonary, you know that it pertains to lungs, right? So pulmonary circulation literally means blood flowing in and out of the lungs, okay? And it starts at the right ventricle with low oxygen in the blood. The right ventricle pumps low oxygen in the blood to the lungs, and lungs is where the gas exchange occurs, where we, where we want, where we take in oxygen and throw away carbon dioxide. Okay, <clears throat> so gas exchange occur in the lungs. So then they carry oxygen in the blood back to the left atrium. Okay, so that's pulmonary circulation. Now, let's talk about systemic circulation. Systemic circulation is the circuit through which uh, oxygen in the blood travels from the left ventricle through the aorta, through the organ system, and back to the right atrium with low oxygen in the blood, okay? So systemic circulation starts in the left ventricle. Left ventricle pumps oxygen in the blood um, through the aorta and then through the organ systems and then come back through the veins to the right atrium, to the superior, superior and inferior vena cava. And um, systemic, systemic means like our whole body system, right? So systemic circulation literally means blood flowing through our bodies, except our lungs, because lungs, it's different circulation, it's pulmonary circulation, right? So there's two different types of blood circulation, all right? And we can have a closer look at this. I'm gonna have, show you an animation real quick. I found this GIF on Google, so I thought it was pretty cool. Um, so let's quickly go over this again. So right ventricles, Pulmonary, let's talk about pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary circulation starts in the right ventricle and it pumps low oxygen in the blood to the pulmonary trunk right here, right? And then to the lungs and gas exchange occur. And then the gas exchange occur, they come back to the heart through the left atrium here. Okay, so that's pulmonary circulation. And then quickly about um, Systemic circulation. Systemic circulation starts in the left ventricle, pumps blood through the aorta. It's not really shown here, but it's right here, the aorta, and goes out to the body, right? Everywhere else. And it comes back to the heart through the right atrium with low oxygen in the blood, okay? It's not, the atrium is not really shown here, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, so that's both systemic and pulmonary circulation, all right? Any questions about this? All right, cool. Now let's have a quick practice question. 
Um, let's see. The two ventricles of the heart are separated by what? What is that muscle called? I'm gonna give you guys 30 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, cool. Okay, so the correct answer is E. So remember, we only have two ventricles of the heart, right? So when you see the term interventricular septum, inter means between, right? So between the ventricles and which indicates separation. So um, the two ventricles of the heart are separated by this muscle called the interventricular septum, all right? Okay. <clears throat> now, another one. I'll make you guys 30 seconds to answer this real quick. Blood ejected from the heart simultaneously enters both systemic and pulmonary circulation. Is that true or false? <clears throat> I'm gonna give you guys 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Okay, so it's a 50-50, right? I can, I can see some of you guys say it's true, some of you guys say it's false. Well, the correct answer is true. Now, here's why. Remember how I said um, during the heartbeat, right? During, during the heart contraction. So blood ejected from the heart, from the ventricles, they simultaneously uh, enter both systemic and pulmonary circulation. Let's take a closer look at this, right? So when the heart beats, both of the right and left ventricle pump together, right? And I told you where um, the right ventricle pumps. Right ventricle pumps blood to pulmonary circulation, while left ventricle pumps blood to systemic circulation. So the answer to that question is true right? Because blood ejected from the heart simultaneously, they enter uh, both of the systemic and pulmonary circulation at the same time, simultaneously, All right? Does that make sense? Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> now let's go over the cardiac cycle. Um, so the cardiac cycle is pretty much the alternating contractions and relaxations of the atria and ventricles, okay? And, and it consists of two periods, right? Systole and diastole. So let's take a look at systole first. So systole is the period when the con ventricles contract, right? Systole uh, is characterized by isovolumetric contraction, right? When both the ventricles contract together, right? We've, We've discussed this in the previous slide. So systole is um, when the ventricles contract. Now, during ventricles, ventricular contraction, um, there's gonna be a tension buildup. So there's gonna be an increase in pressure in the ventricles, okay? Now, the increase with the increase of pressure or of ventricular pressure, there's gonna be a closure in the AV valves, in the atrial ventricular valves. Remember the, tricuspid and bicuspid valves, right? So there's, there's gonna be a closure of these two valves only, these AV valves, right? And this causes the first heart sound, the love, okay? Remember the heart sound? You can hear, you can, the heart sounds can be heard through a stethoscope, right? So the first heart sound, love, 
is when it's during the closure of the AV valves when the ventricles contract. Okay. Now, uh, obviously, when the ventricles contract, um, the ventricles ejects blood into systemic and pulmonary circulation. Right. I've mentioned that. Right. So blood ejects into aorta and pulmonary trunk. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now the amount of blood ejected by the ventricles um, during systole is termed stroke volume, all right? The stroke volume is how much blood, it's the total amount of blood that the ventricles pump, okay? At the, uh, during, during systole, okay? Now, let's talk about diastole. Diastole is the second um, cardiac cycle. So since systole is uh, the ventricles contracting, what is diastole then? Can anybody tell me what diastole um, is? What occurs during diastole? Okay, I see one response so far. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two responses. Okay, perfect. So diastole, right, you guys, you guys said this. So diastole is when the ventricles relax, right? This is during the filling of the ventricles. Um, and it's characterized by isovolumetric relaxation. And the ventricles relax together, right? So um, when the ventricles relax, there's gonna be less tension. Less tension means less pressure, okay? So when, when the ventricular pressure decreases, when it lowers, there's gonna, um, the, the semilunar valves are gonna close, right? Semilunar valves are um, the aortic and pulmonary valves, remember? Okay, so with the decrease in ventricular pressure, the semilunar valves are gonna close. Now, the closure of the semilunar valves causes second sound of the heart, the dub sound, okay? Right, so remember the heart sound does not come from you know the ventricles contracting or blood filling, but heart sounds come from um, the closure of valves of heart valves. Okay, so now the ventricle when the ventricles relax, there's going to be a rapid filling of the ventricles. Right, the AV valves open up, rapid filling of the ventricles, and the atrium, the right and left atrium, delivers a final amount of blood. They contract to deliver the final amount of blood into ventricles. Okay, now the amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole is termed end diastolic volume. Okay, this is the amount of blood that's sitting in the ventricles, right? It sits in the ventricles just prior to the ventricles contracting again. Okay, so that's called the end diastolic volume. Make sense? Any questions about the cardiac cycle? Okay. All right. Now we can just briefly go over this quickly again. Um, so let's look at Sicily first. Sicily is when the ventricles contract, right? So when the ventricles contract, there's gonna be a built-in pressure. So uh, when the pressure increases, the AV valve closes because, because when the ventricles contract, we don't want blood to flow back into the atrium, right? That's why the AV valves have to close, right? So the, the closure of AV valves, um, that's going to be the first sound of the heart, love, okay? And obviously when the ventricles contract, it's going to be an ejection of blood into pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation, right? And then uh, we have diastole. Diastole is when the ventricles relax, right? Um, and there's gonna be a rapid filling of the blood. The ventricles are gonna get filled in this phase, right? And when they're filling, the semilunar valves have to close because when the ventricles are filling, uh, blood can't go into pulmonary or systemic circulation, right? Because they're being filled. They're not actively contracting right now, they're relaxing. <clears throat> So, and then the last step, the atrium contracts the final amount of blood into the um, ventricles. 
and which is known as the end diastolic volume. Okay. That's a quick review of that. Now let's have a check for understanding question. This one should be pretty straightforward, right? Because the answer is literally in the question. Okay. I think you guys 30 seconds to answer this one. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. So you guys all answered this correctly, right? The correct answer is false, it's pretty straightforward. End diastolic volume, uh, or, or the one word I would change here would be stroke volume, and I would change it to end diastolic volume, okay? At the end of diastole, okay? Uh, one more here, one more question. What is the cause of the love heart sound. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to close the poll in five seconds. <clears throat> okay. So the correct answer is C, right? Remember how I said the heart sound, the two heart sound, the love, the, it does not come from um, blood ejection. It does not come from contraction or anything, but it's rather the closure of the valves, okay? is the closure of the heart valves. And the first sound, the love, right, uh, causes is caused by the closure of the AV valves. And then answer B, right, this semilunar valves causes the second heart sound, dub sound, right? Okay, all right. Now let's talk about, let's go over chapter 14, cardiac output, blood flow, and blood pressure. So in this chapter, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about cardiac output and the factors that regulate cardiac output, right? Stroke volume, heart rate. And I'm also gonna talk about um, baroreceptor reflex. So cardiac, cardiac output is defined as the volume of blood that each ventricle pumps per unit of time, All right? Remember how we mentioned stroke volume. Stroke volume, um, it's the volume of blood that each ventricle pumps, right? But it doesn't necessarily measure or include a unit of time, right? So with that, I have a question for you guys. What is the formula for cardiac output then? What is cardiac output made up of? Can anybody tell me the answer, the formula to that? <clears throat> Okay, I see three responses, four, okay, perfect, exactly. So the formula for cardiac output is heart rate and stroke volume, right? We see like, you know, stroke volume has to be included here because it measures the volume of blood that each ventricle pumps. And heart rate gives us a measure of time, a unit of time, right? So cardiac output is a product of heart rate and stroke volume. Now with this, we can, see that if we want to increase cardiac output, we have to increase both heart rate and stroke volume or stroke volume, right? But if we want to decrease cardiac output, heart rate and stroke volume has to be decreased too, okay? Pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about factors that regulate cardiac output, right? I mentioned that if we want to decrease or increase heart, uh, cardiac output, heart rate and stroke volume has to be 
um, regulated, how to be altered. Now let's first talk about regulation of heart rate. So there are two main ne important neurotransmitters that are released into the bloodstream to increase heart rate. Does anybody know what are the two neurotransmitters that increases heart rate? <clears throat> I see one response so far. Anybody remember what the two neurotransmitters are? Okay, so the correct answer is norepinephrine, epinephrine, right? So acetylcholine, we're gonna talk about that later. Acetylcholine is the other neurotransmitter for, um, for the decrease of heart rate. So in order to increase heart rate, the two neurotransmitters secreted are norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine uh, secreted by the sympathetic nervous system and the epinephrine secreted by the adrenal medulla, okay, of the medulla uh, of the adrenal gland. So in order for norepinephrine, epinephrine, epinephrine blah, 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 sorry, in order for norepinephrine and epinephrine to function, they have to bind to these receptors located on the sinoatrial node called the beta adrenergic receptors, okay? So norepinephrine and epinephrine binds to these beta adrenergic receptors located in the sinoatrial node. Remember, the sinoatrial node is um, the heart's pacemaker, right? Is what, is what controls the heart rate. So when norepinephrine and epinephrine binds to these receptors, the result is faster rate of depolarization. What does that mean? Well, faster rate of depolarization literally means um, faster heart rate, increase of heart rate, right? The, when the heart depolarizes quicker, okay? So that's, um, that's what's involved in the increase of heart rate, all right? So we know that norepinephrine and epinephrine um, increases heart rate. And we also know that acetylcholine is uh, right, you mentioned that acetylcholine uh, is, is released to help decrease heart rate. But does anybody remember what system or what nervous system releases acetylcholine? Is it the sympathetic or the parasympathetic? Perfect. Nice. Um, what does it mean for something to be beta adrenergic? That's a great question. Uh, the, the way I like to think of it, well, I guess it's just the name of the receptors, right? Um, so I don't really, I don't wanna go too in too detail of it because I'm not really familiar with why, um, what it means to be beta adrenergic, right? So um, can't really answer that question, but I just know that um, beta adrenergic receptors is one of the receptors located in the sinoatrial node. And there's also many different receptors located in the sinoatrial node, right? But beta adrenergic is one of them. Now, let's look at the other receptor, okay? You guys all mentioned that acetylcholine is released by the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Which is opposite to that of the sympathetic. Sympathetic is like our fight or flight, remember? And um, parasympathetic is, you can kind of say like it's rest and digest, right? It's resting. So acetylcholine is released from, uh, by the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, in order for acetylcholine to function, it must bind to the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors located in the sinoatrial node, okay? So acetylcholine binds to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, as a result, when acetylcholine binds to these receptors, the result is slower rates of depolarization, right? Means the heart depolarizes slower. So there's gonna be a decrease in heart rate, okay? And um, acetylcholine and the parasympathetic nervous system is what keeps our heart rate 
below 100 beats per minute. All right, <clears throat> sorry, all right. Okay, cool. Any questions about this so far? Awesome. All right. Now let's talk about the regulation of stroke volume. So what factors regulate amount of, uh, um, the amount of stroke volume? So the first one is end diastolic volume, right? But does anyone remember what end diastolic volume is? Let's throw it out. EDV, what is end diastolic volume? Is it the amount of blood pumped by ventricles or is it the amount of blood filled in ventricles? Right, so end diastolic volume is the amount in the ventricles, filled in ventricles, right? Good job. It's the amount of, uh, amount of blood filled in the ventricles at the end of diastole, right? It's the amount that sits in ventricles just prior to systole occurring again, just prior to ventricles contracting again, right? Now, when there's a higher level, when there's greater end diastolic volume, there's going to be a greater stroke volume. Well, why is that? Well, greater end diastolic volume allows for optimal stretching of the cardiac muscles of the ventricles, right? What does optimal stretch mean? Can anybody tell me what optimal stretch means? Does anybody remember from the muscle chapter? Okay, no worries. So optimal stretch means that, remember actin and myosin it's going to have greater interactions, right? So they stretch out more so then they can um, interact better. Actin and myosin is going to interact better. Okay, that's what optimal stretching means, right? And this relates to um, the Frank Starling, Frank Starling law of the heart, right? Which states that greater stretch of cardiac, cardiac muscles result in a stronger contraction, right? So when, when it's, what is meant by optimal stretch is just um, when actin and myosin are optimally aligned, right? They can interact a lot better. So the result is greater, uh, a stronger contraction, right? So a strong contraction means stronger, stro uh, greater stroke volume, okay? Because the heart stronger, strong enough to pump more blood, okay? So that's the first factor. Now, the second factor is total peripheral resistance. Um, so quickly, quickly, um, resistance is defined as any impedance to blood flow, right? This can be in the form of vasoconstriction or a narrowing of the vessel, right? Impedance. Um, so greater, greater resistance, greater total per peripheral resistance, um, the lower the stroke volume. Okay. Well, why is that? Well, if there's more resistance in the blood flow, if there's more resistance in the blood vessels, the heart has to pump a lot harder to deliver blood throughout the body, right? So if there's more impedance to blood flow, if there's more vasoconstriction, if there's more narrowing of the blood vessels, the heart has to pump harder to deliver blood throughout the body, okay? That's a second factor. <clears throat> now, lastly, uh, we have the strength of the ventricles, the contractility, okay? Um, so the strength of the ventricles relies on two, rely on two main neurotransmitters, right? Norepinephrine and epinephrine. Remember how we talked about uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine also play a role when it, when it comes to increase of heart rate, right? But um, norepinephrine and epinephrine also increase the strength of the ventricles, ventricular contractility. Okay, so uh, no, when norepinephrine and epinephrine is released to the bloodstream, um, the ventricles become stronger. And stronger ventricles means 
more stroke volume can be pumped out the heart. Make sense? So more stronger the heart, greater stroke volume, greater the total peripheral resistance, lower the stroke volume, and greater end diastolic volume, greater the stroke volume. Make sense? Any questions so far? Awesome. All right. Let's have a check for understanding practice question. Regulation of heart rate. Okay. <clears throat> so which of the following factors does not decrease heart rate? I'm gonna give you guys about a minute to answer this one. And to answer Alyssa's question, yes, the recording of the session, um, it would not be emailed to you all, but it would be posted to, it would be posted on our um, YouTube channel website, our CHHS Student Success Center website. And this is the link to both the survey and the YouTube. But if you want the, like, the workshop slides sent to you via the email, then you have to fill out the feedback survey. Okay. And yes, these are like very, these are the kinds of questions that would be on the exam. Like they're very similar. Okay. Uh, receptors being protein and how their nicotinic is muscle. What does nicotinic mean in terms of this? That is nicotinic muscles. Uh, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, does anybody know what nicotinic means when it, in terms of muscles? Okay, so Esther said it refers, to, it might refer to muscle contraction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not too familiar with why, uh, what the nicotine means in terms of the receptors and muscles, but uh, if, but I highly suggest you can Google it. I'm pretty sure Google usually would give you like a better answer, right? So, um, for now, let's let's go over this question. So the answer to this question is E, right? So remember, epinephrine and norepinephrine increases heart rate, right? So they do not decrease heart rate. Now, acetylcholine and parasympathetic nervous system is what decreases heart rate. So, so yeah. So the answer would be B and C here because norepinephrine, epinephrine increases heart rate rather than decrease. Okay. Thank you, Esther. All right. So let's have another check for our understanding. Stroke volume increases when there is blank. I'm gonna give you guys 15 more seconds. <clears throat> okay. okay, let's end the poll. 
So some of you guys said it's C, some of you guys is D, some of you guys said it's E. So the correct answer is D. Stroke volume increases when there is a greater end diastolic volume, okay? So let's talk about C. C wouldn't be correct because remember when I said, remember what I said, right? When there's greater resistance, there's gonna be a lower stroke volume, right? Because the heart has to pump harder to deliver blood, to deliver blood, deliver blood through that blood vessel, right? But if the blood vessel is vasoconstricting, right? if they're constricting and narrowed, then there's gonna be greater resistance and greater resistance means lower stroke volume. And E would also be false because um, stroke volume increases when there's an increased ventricular contractility. Okay, so uh, so when the heart is stronger, right, is able to pump more blood, meaning stroke volume will increase if there's a stronger ventricle, increased ventricular contraction. Okay, and epinephrine helps with that. Epinephrine increases ventricular contractility, so we want more epinephrine. All right, and venous return. Venous return is what gives us more end diastolic volume. Right, because the atrium pumps blood to the ventricles during diastole. So when there's more venous return, when there's more coming back to the heart, there's going to be greater end diastolic volume. Okay, make sense? All right. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna quickly go over the barrel receptor reflex. I'm sure this is pretty straightforward. So. The bell receptors are one of our body's um, homeostatic mechanisms, right? What does that mean? Well, bell receptors are responsible for blood pressure homeostasis, right? Keeps our blood pressure at nearly constant levels. Um, and these are the stretch receptors that are located in two different locations, right? In the aortic arc and the carotid sinuses, right? Two different locations. Now, as I've mentioned, these bare receptors um, uh, they detect changes in blood pressure in the mean arterial pressure. But what is meant by the term mean arterial pressure? Can anybody tell me what is that? What is the definition to that? Mm, I see one response so far. Mean arterial pressure. So, Emanuela, so you said average pressure during cardiac cycle, right? So remember, we have two different cardiac cycles. We have systole and diastole, right? Um, and diastole is during the filling of the heart, of the ventricles, and uh, systole is during pumping, the contraction of the ventricles. So remember, ventricles pumps blood to systemic and pulmonary circulation to the arteries, okay? So you're, you're, you're almost there, it's during systole, right? So mean arterial pressure is the pressure driving, in, driving the blood into the tissues, right? So um, it is the average, pressure that drives the blood to the tissue. Now, bell receptors sense changes, right? And, and I put except lungs here because remember how I said the bell receptors are located in the aortic arc and the carotid sinuses, right? So, and, and pulmonary circulation is different, right? These bell receptors um, are only located in the aortic arc and the and the carotid sinuses, right? So I'm sure um, the pulmonary circulation have their own receptors, right? But for this, we're focusing on um, the arterial pressure of systemic circulation, okay? So um, there's a pressure driving the blood into the tissues. Now, when bare receptors sense changes in MAP, um, they deliver that information to an integrating center called medulla oblongata. Okay, so when the change sends that information, sends a change in arterial pressure, 
they're going to deliver that information to the medulla. Now, the result is an autonom autonomic output to heart and vessels. Autonomics means like um, automatic and output means out, right? So they help the medulla oblongata um, produce and respond or an effect, right? So for example, let's say there is a decrease in blood pressure, okay? Baroreceptor reflex is going to sense that, right? They're going to detect, oh, there's less stretch uh, of, of the blood pressure, the, of the blood vessels, right? They're going to sense that. So baroreceptors sense that change. They're going to tell medulla, tell, uh, deliver that information to the medulla and tell them that, oh, there's a decrease in blood pressure. Now, the medulla oblongata can, one, vasoconstrict the arterioles to narrow it. To vasoconstriction means constricting the blood vessels, right? Vasoconstriction arterioles to increase resistance, okay? Now, of course, the more resistance there is, the higher the blood pressure, okay? Or they can also increase cardiac rate, heart rate and input and increase cardiac output to increase blood pressure, okay? So um, this is a good flow chart to study, I think, all right? Is there any questions about the baroreceptor reflex? Okay. That's that. Um, so we have seven more minutes and I have a few more slides to cover, but I don't think I'm gonna go over every single one of them. I'm going to cover, I'm gonna briefly talk about ventilation mechanics, okay? Um, so the baroreceptor reflex only applies to systemic circulation. Exactly. So remember how, you know, remember, um, these receptors are located in the aortic arc in the carotid sinuses, right? Which means these arteries does not have anything to do with um, pulmonary circulation, right? Pulmonary circulation is different, okay? And these receptors only detect changes in, uh, in the pressure that drives the blood to the tissues, except the lungs. So, so to answer your question, yes, baroreceptor reflex only applies to systemic circulation, okay? Did that help? All right, awesome. Okay, so yeah, for chapter 16, um, Oh, I'm sure you guys don't have the test on chapter 15, right? It's just 11, 13, 14, and 16. Okay. Oh, sorry. Did I say 15? All right. I meant 16. Okay. So um, I'm going to quickly go over ventilation mechanics because at the end, I want to uh, go over one more slide, okay? So I'm gonna skip this. These are just like respiratory system structures. Um, let's quickly go over, go over ventilation mechanics, okay? So air moves from high pressure region to low pressure region, right? There's a passive movement. I'm sure we all know this. Like similar to osmosis, osmosis, right? Remember how water moves from a pressure of, uh, moves from pressure, moves from an area with low concentration of solutes to an area where there's a higher concentration of solutes. So it's a similar concept. It's a similar like passive movement, right? Now in respiratory system, air moves from high pressure region to low pressure region, okay? And now we have um, the alveolar pressure, alveolar pressure and atmospheric pressure or intra-alveolar pressure, okay? So in order to inhale, right, for inspiration, um, alveolar pressure must be lower than atmospheric pressure, right? Here's why. So remember how air moves from pressure or high pressure region to low pressure region, right? So right, in order for its inhale, alveolar pressure, the air inside of a lungs has to be lower than that outside of the lungs, the atmospheric pressure. So if 
alveolar pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, then um, the air is going to flow in from outside to inside. Okay, high pressure to low pressure. And similarly, in order to exhale for expiration, alveolar, alveolar pressure has to be greater than atmospheric pressure. So air flows out. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a brief concept of that. Um, and I kept this chart here, but I'm not going to go over it during my workshop, but um, I can send you guys, email you guys a slide after you guys filled out the feedback survey and you guys can study off of this, right? So uh, I'm going to skip this question as well. We have three more minutes. I want to go over this slide real quick. So these are the important topics that Dr. Anand and I have discussed on and uh, that I that we highly suggest you all to study and review. So chapter 11, study the four types, four different types of hormones, right? For example, amino acids, uh, polypeptides, proteins, you know, the different types of hormones. Also study the three hormone sequence, right? Remember how I gave you guys a chart. So I think it's beneficial to study off of that chart. And also synthesis of thyroid hormones and structures in thyroid gland. Um, chapter 13, we talked about a lot about systemic and pulmonary circulation. So you guys are pretty familiar with it, right? And cardiac cycle, systole and diastole. And also understand the correspondence of the ECG with the cardiac cycle, right? The P wave, PQRST. And then chapter 14, um, cardiac output and factors that regulate cardiac output, right? Stroke volume, heart rate, we've talked about that. And also factors that regulate blood volume, okay? Fluid of our blood. And then 16, uh, ventilation and lung mechanics, gas exchange, and these are the topics, right? So unfortunately, um, yeah, so unfortunately uh, we don't have, we're running out of time, so, um, I can any answer last. I can answer any last final questions, or you can feel free to send me an email if you need help. Right? I would, I would type in my email on the chat box now. So, if you have any questions, you can just email me. I will get back to you as early as possible. And one last thing. Uh, please, please, please fill out the feedback survey so then I can send you guys the uh, workshop slides. And um, also the, the workshop videos. The workshop videos are going to be posted on our YouTube channel, right? And uh, the, you, the, the video will be posted by tonight, okay? We post it by tonight. And that is all for the workshop. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you guys.